So welcome to today's uh, colloquium. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Hao Cao from uh, Caltech. Uh, just in case you haven't, haven't noticed, his first name is uh, Hao. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we really welcome him. <laughs> and uh, and actually, I think in, in Chinese, he's... Dr. wants to capitalize that and make it H-A-R. that's right. Yeah, it means uh, grand or really good. Or, so, so, H- so we shouldn't change our name. Yeah, high expectation. Right. Uh, so Hao received his uh, bachelor degree, bachelor of science degree from the University of Science and Technology of China in 2009, and uh, and uh, actually participated in research uh, when he was an undergraduate there. He worked on solar pro- uh, solar prominence with uh, stereo data. Uh, he received his PhD from uh, ge- uh, in geophysics and space physics from the uh, UCLA in last year, 2014. Uh, and for the thesis research, he worked on the Cassini uh, magnetometer data uh, analysis, also numerical dynamo simulations. Uh, he then uh, moved next door to Caltech, uh, and now he's a postdoc there. Uh, his research topic now is on interior dynamics of giant planets uh, and using gravity fields and the magnetic field as uh, diag- diagnostics. Uh, also, he has been recently selected as the Cassini Participating Scientist, and he's also a member of the Juno Interior Working Group. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, planetary magnetic fields. Uh, mainly, I'm talking about from the perspective of uh, interiors, uh, dynamo action, and also uh, interior dynamics. I emphasized uh, symmetry and symmetry breaking in my uh, title, and you're going to see that that actually is a theme uh, throughout this presentation. But first, let me show you this. Um, this is a very ancient uh, geomagnetic map actually made by uh, Edmund Halle in 1701. And this is the same Halle, uh, the famous Halle comet is named after. And the, you see the continents here, the uh, North America, uh, South America, and uh, part of the Europe and Africa. And on the oceans, you see those lines. Those are actually contour lines of uh, geomagnetic declination. So geomagnetic declination is the angle between the local horizontal magnetic field and the uh, local uh, north direction. And you see all these uh, contours on the oceans. And the reason is simple. Uh, they made those maps for a navigation purpose. They want to know where actually the north is given the correction of the uh, magnetic field. And there's no lines on land. People don't need magnetic field for navigation on the land. Um, it's quite impressive that uh, even back then they have such a good record of uh, uh, geomagnetic field, even though it is not realized that actually can use them to study the interior of the Earth. What uh, is the thick line? Oh, the thick line is just, uh, I, th- I think, zero. maybe it's zero declination, but I'm not entirely sure, actually. It goes to Cape Hatteras. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, right now, the situation is reversed. We have constant magnetic record on the ground. We have uh, magnetometers, ground stations. We don't have continuous monitors on the oceans anymore. Um, well, there's actually a technical reason, because nowadays, the ships are made of iron. If you really want to do magnetic measurement on a ship, you actually need to demagnetize your entire ship. <laughs> um, so those uh, declination measurement actually goes back all the way to uh, the uh, uh, end of the 1500s. And from that, um, it's mainly uh, uh, Jeremy Bloxham and Andy Jackson uh, take all the pain work actually went back to the Great Britain Library and pull out all the ship logs and pull out the declination data, digitize them, and then reconstruct the magnetic field of the Earth for the past 400 years. And here's actually going to, it's a movie, and showing the Earth's magnetic field on the core mantle boundary, actually, radio component on the core mantle boundary, reconstructed all the way uh, back to uh, 400 years. Um, is that based on potential fields? Yes, uh, it, it, yeah, it's just uh, it's simply a potential field extrapolation, assuming there's no currents in the mantle, which is, uh, which is good enough for the large-scale fields. Um, uh, 
yeah, on the core mantle boundary, you do see uh, variations of the uh, magnetic field, both on large scale and small scale. And those are actually the base for the uh, core surface flow inversions, which I'm going to show uh, details later. Um, oh, this one again. Um, so the reason for a planetary scientist to study magnetic fields is uh, really try, not only try to understand dynamics, but also use it as a tool to understand uh, the host planets. So I'm showing you a, uh, two diagrams. On the left, I'm trying to show you how, the plan how a planet actually works. And on the right, I'm trying to show you how we actually figure out uh, the process. So a uh, particular formation scenario and uh, the following evolution path of a planet actually determines its present day interior structure uh, and dynamics, whether you have a liquid core or not and whether the core is undergoing a convection or not. And it actually dictates the dynamo process. It determines whether a planet can have a magnetic field or not, and also the characteristics of the magnetic field, how strong the field is, and what's the geometry of the field. And when we're doing it, we're actually going from bottom up. We're actually measuring uh, the magnetic field. Uh, on Earth, it's uh, surface measurement and uh, low altitude spacecraft for all other planets other than Jupiter, uh, all our knowledge of the magnetic field actually coming from in situ magnetometer measurements. We measure a particular field strength and we measure uh, the geometry and also secular variation if we have enough uh, uh, time span. And from those, we try to, if we have a good understanding of the dynamo process, we try to infer what's the buoyancy forcing inside the planet is, uh, where the phase changes are, where the surface of the core is, or where the bottom of the boundary is. And uh, from secular variation, we're also trying to figure out the flow characteristics. So you cannot directly see inside planets. If you want to know what the flows inside the planets are, actually magnetic field is a very good kind of a very good tool to use. And then further extrapolation is uh, you want to say something about the energy budget of planet. It's not a problem for a star. That star always have enough energy to convect and give you a magnetic field. Um, but planets, in, in particular terrestrial planet, is usually very sh short in terms of energy. If you run evolution calculation for terrestrial planet, most likely today, most terrestrial planet will not have a magnetic field from a nominal evolution uh, calculation. Um, and for Earth, from seismology, we know Earth has a solid inner core, but we actually don't know the age of the solid inner core. Uh, the current estimate goes all the way from 500 million years to 3 billion years. We know order of magnitude. Um, and for a giant planet, it's very hard. You go to a talk and not hearing people mentioning the core of a giant planet. Because it's hoped that by knowing how big the rocky core inside a giant planet are, we actually can say something about uh, the formation scenario of a giant planet. So stars forms by a collapse of molecular clouds. And for giant planets, a gas giant, Jupiter and Saturn, there are two competing theories for the formation of the planet. One is called core accretion. So first, you put together a heavy, like rocky core, 10 Earth mass. Then it gravitationally attracts all the uh, hydrogen and helium gas around it. And you put together a giant planet. And the second uh, hypothesis is just gas instability in the disk. So you don't need a core. You don't need a rocky core to start with at all. So the argument is always, if you have a very massive core inside a giant planet, then it actually favors the core accretion scenario over the other. And if it turns out you measured a very small uh, rocky core inside a giant planet, then that actually favors the uh, gas instability scenario. Um, so those are really an, an overview how study magnetic fields actually fits into the big picture of studying planets. Um, and this is the outline of today's talk. I'm going to give a short introduction to planetary magnetism. Um, I'll say more about Earth, since we know more about the Earth. And also, today is the Earth Day. Um, then we'll talk about Mercury's uh, north-south asymmetric uh, magnetic field. It has been uh, recently discovered um, by the messenger spacecraft that on the surface of Mercury, the magnetic field in its northern hemisphere is three times stronger than the magnetic field in the southern hemisphere. So there is a big north-south asymmetry, and I would like to understand why. 
And the third part, I will talk about uh, zonal flow and magnetic fields in the transition region inside giant planet. And here, transition region I specifically uh, means the transition from a uh, non-conducting part to the uh, to the electrically conducting part, but this is a smooth transition without any first order uh, phase changes. So here's just a quick graphic overview of what the magnetic field of planets in their solar system looks like, uh, Mercury, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Those are the six planets that have uh, global scale magnetic fields. Uh, Venus don't see, don't have, we don't know Venus have any uh, uh, magnetic field, and we don't even know whether Venus has crustal magnetic field. But Mars and uh, the MGS mission have shown us there's strong crustal magnetization in the southern hemisphere, but it's a uh, small scale. If you first just look at the diagram, you'll see that you probably can broadly divide them into two groups. Um, the first, uh, the upper four, actually have relatively simple geometry. It's mainly a dipole dominant. Um, so in each hemisphere, the magnetic field is basically uh, one polarity. And the bottom two, the uh, ice giant, Uranus and Neptune, has a fundamentally more complex uh, magnetic field. Sometimes you will hear uh, people referring to Uranus and Neptune's field as a uh, strongly tilted dipole. But that actually is a very bad description, because dipole is a bad uh, description for Uranus and Neptune in general. You can't really approximate their fields using dipoles. Um, this figure didn't show that that well, but actually the Mercury is the only planet among the four dipole dominant planet that also has a huge asymmetry across the two hemispheres. You can analyze the uh, magnetic field quantitatively. Here I'm showing you the equatorial asymmetry versus axis symmetry. So, uh, horizontal axis just tell you how different the field strengths in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere is. If it's zero, then it's exactly the same. If it's one, it's strongly different. And axis symmetry is uh, it's, if it's symmetric uh, with respect to the spin axis, you get one. If it's non-symmetric, you get zero. So Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn basically fall on the uh, left or right corner. So are, are those maps for Neptune and Uranus all from Voyager 2 data? Yes, those are all from uh, Voyager 2 data, with one more constraint from the uh, uh, observation of the aurora. Mm -hmm. So you actually know where the aurora boundary is, and you try to actually uh, back up uh, what the uh, magnetic field is. So you have slightly more information on that. Yes. But yeah, um, the only possibility for Uranus and Neptune is actually their magnetic field is even more complex than what I showed you, uh, because the uh, high moment can have even more higher power. But yes, you're definitely right. Um, yeah, Uranus and Neptune seems to be in a state where it's uh, uh, not axis symmetric and not equatorially uh, symmetric. And Mercury is the only one actually on the right uh, upper corner. Um, so this is really about the uh, geometry. And the magnetic field of planets actually spans a wide range of strengths. So Mercury is about 300 nanotesla on the surface. Um, Jupiter is about 400,000 nanotesla on its surface. And we actually still don't, uh, we still do not understand uh, why there's such a, a large range uh, of field strengths. And here, in a review paper by uh, Uli Christensen, he listed nine scaling laws for the magnetic field strengths. And neither of them, uh, none of them actually work uh, for all the planets we know. That's why we actually have nine, otherwise we just have one. <laughs> That's one per planet. <laughs> so they work for a, a class of planet, like yeah, ice giants. Uh, ice shine actually, um, so here's the thing. Um, so those scaling laws are generally derived with uh, two principles. One is uh, force balance. So you assume the Lorentz force balanced by the Coriolis force, and that gives you a, uh, a estimate of the field strength, since you know rotation and you know all the stuff. And that gets Jupiter Earth right. Um, Saturn is force below. So the number should be 1, and the value for Saturn is 0 0.01. So, and value for Uranus and Neptune is 0.001. And the value for Mercury is 10 to the minus 5. So if you do force balance. Mm -hmm. And you can also do an energy balance. You say the fl uh, 
thermal flux coming out of the planet uh, sh uh, should be, uh, so the uh, ohmic dissipation associated with a dynamo should not exceed the thermal flux coming out of the planet. And that gets you a few strings. It also gets Jupiter and Earth right, and the others also are in, in trouble. So, so I mean, Jupiter Earth seems normal, and all the others seems abnormal. Uh, yeah. So that, that are moons important at all? I'm sorry. Tidal effects of moons are they important at all? Uh, I I don't think tidal effects for the moons in our solar system matters. Yeah. Um, I think I've I've seen the uh, estimate of the tidal effects, and essentially all solar system bodies like falls below the critical line where tidals can matter. Uh, does the does something like a Mach balance scaling work for any of the planets very well? Uh, yeah, I mean most of the scalings actually work for Jupiter and Earth very well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So some of the some of those planets are sort of dynamically odd too. Does that play any role in the magnetic field? I mean, like either Uranus or Neptune has a, a rotational axis which is way out of the. Yes, we are out of the ecliptic plane. Uh, Mercury's eccentric, well, it's eccentric and yes. inclined. Uh, for almost all the planets in the solar system, even for Mercury, all this mechanical forcing, because when we talk about tilt and eccentricity, we're really talking about mechanical forcing. And all the mechanical forcing seems to be way smaller than any of the thermal forcing or compositional forcing we can think of. So mechanical forcing becomes important when you go to smaller planets, because now the for asteroid, the mechanical forcing can be important, vibration and uh, a tidal force. But for, for planets, anything bigger than the moon, the mechanical forcing, if you do an auto magnitude calculation, mechanical forcing doesn't seem to matter. Yes. OK. Um, so we actually know quite a lot about the uh, magnetic field of the Earth. And this is, a, this is from the epoch uh, 2010, so the most uh, the most latest one. You see the uh, magnetic field on the surface of the Earth, BR, and also BR at the core mantle boundary through a, a potential uh, extrapolation. Um, even on the core mantle boundary, the magnetic field of Earth is still dipole dominant because one hemisphere is dominated by one polarity. It's uh, negative on north and positive in south. Of course, you do see those uh, reversed flux patches in the uh, southern hemisphere. If you actually monitor, the, this reversed patch, it, it has been keep growing since the past 50 years, which we have good data. So we actually have good data showing you the reversed uh, flux patch is growing. And that's why occasionally you hear crazy, maybe not crazy, you hear a statement that Earth's magnetic field is like going to flip. Because if you actually come from a geodynamo guy, it's usually based on the argument that the reversed flux patch seems to grow in, and it might take over. Oh, um, so you, the, the observation is actually at the surface, and then this, yes. the core mantle is, is an extrapolation, it's an extrapolation. From the surface observation. Yes, okay. and the only assumption goes into the extrapolation is the electrical currents flowing in the mantle is uh, negligible on this level. So uh, it's, it's a pretty good assumption. Um, um, you can also uh, construct the uh, power spectrum for the geomagnetic field, simply the power contained at each spheric harmonic degree. Uh, on the surface, uh, it's a, a power law drop. And on the cold mantle boundary, it has, actually has a peculiar feature that uh, if you do not look at the dipole uh, moment, all the power in the, the rest of the uh, moment seems to be, at least it's comparable to each other. And whether it's a flat spectrum or not, uh, we don't know. And we still do not fully understand why this is the case, and whether this is a just for Earth, or actually it's a generic property for all dipole dominant and magnetic field. We don't know that, actually. Do you have a sense of how strong our constraints are on the core mantle boundary, given the, the extrapolation through the insulating mantle? Because uh, Oh, um, yeah, actually, this is a very, uh, we, are, we are already very uh, uh, conservative here, because on the surface, the measurement of the magnetic field goes all the way up to degree 500. Mm -hmm. so, and we believe that anything beyond degree 14 is crustal. So we only extrapolate anything below degree 14. And this is already a very conservative uh, 
we're not we're not pushing the boundaries and, and should we should we think of the like the power values here should we think of them as limits or are they actually um, the values yeah I think I think uh, at least up to degree 10 they are actual values okay yeah, um, yeah I'm quite confident on that um, we monitor the uh, secular variation, the time evolution of the magnet gear of the Earth, you can also try to infer what the uh, core surface flow uh, looks like. So this is what has been inferred. Um, the assumption is uh, frozen in flux, of course. The uh, magnetic flux is frozen into the surface flows. And uh, first of all, the amplitude about uh, 20 kilometers per year in terms of meters per second is like 10 to the minus 4 meters per second. Um, you do see a, a strong um, westward flow on this <coughs> hemisphere. And you do see two vortices on each of the, um, on, uh, near each of the polar region. But um, Is there also a constraint like geostrophic motion? Or something oh, like there's a, traditional? yes. Um, I'm not entirely sure about this one, but uh, in terms, try to get the, uh, if you want to invert the flow from the magnetic field, other than flux frozen, you, you actually usually need another constraint. Yeah. And different has been played, and some played uh, geostrophic, so the flow is true, and some also play uh, uh, vertical flows, so you, you assume. Um, but in general, the map is qualitatively similar. And when they differ, I start to worry about uh, which one I should believe. But qualitatively, you get a westward flow uh, near the equator and get what what it says at high latitude. Um, OK, um, with that introduction, I'm going to talk about uh, Mercury. Um, so Mercury is the uh, innermost planet in the solar system. And those are the those are actually the visible images of the four terrestrial planet and solar system stacked together. If you look at them in naked eye, you can see them. They actually look like this. Um, uh, Mercury is, uh, is a tiny uh, planet. And if it's not orbiting the sun, we probably won't call it a planet. Um, so this is the data I'm talking about. So from the uh, messenger orbital measurement, both from the magnetometer measurement and also from the, uh, uh, the eye and pitch angle measurement, we, uh, uh, we discovered that the magnetic field on the surface of Mercury is actually quite different across the two hemispheres. And here showing the field strength. So rather than the radio component, I'm actually showing you the total field strength. So red means strong field, blue means weak field. And so in the northern hemisphere, it's about uh, 700 nanotesla. In the southern hemisphere, it's mostly around uh, 200 nanotesla. So there's a big difference across the two hemispheres. And this is unique uh, to Mercury, and we, we want to know why. Um, so I do not ex expect everyone to be familiar with uh, Mercury. So I give you the very basic scales. I'm going to walk you through the uh, table. Um, so Mercury is uh, small uh, in terms of its Radius is actually smaller than the moon in the solar system. It's smaller than Jupiter's moon, Ganymede. It's more massive uh, because it has a large iron core. And Mercury is a slow rotator compared to Earth. Uh, its rotation is uh, 60 Earth days. Um, it has a huge core. So in terms of radius, 85% of the radius of Mercury is actually its core. And while Earth, uh, Venus, and Mars, roughly it's half of the, of the radius is actually their core. Um, in terms of surface magnetic field, Mercury's field is weak, 300, and Ganymede is even weaker than Ganymede's, of course. Ganymede is about 800, and significantly weaker than Earth. Um, I've said it's a relatively large iron core. Um, we know for sure there is a liquid outer part, actually, and this is from a libration measurement. So we measure the amplitude of the libration of the surface of Mercury. Then you also know all the forces, from uh, mainly from the sun and from other planet. And you find that the amplitude of the libration is significantly larger than if uh, Mercury is a solid, is entirely solid. So that actually tells you the mantle uh, is at least decoupled from the inner core, if there is an inner core. And from that, you actually infer there definitely exists a uh, liquid outer part. Even if you don't know it has a magnetic field, you know it has a liquid iron core. What we don't know is whether it has a solid inner core or not. And this is where uh, uh, people use, uh, is where geophysics and uh, geochemistry diverge, or they never converge, of course. Um, so if you are uh, uh, geophysicists, you 
measure gra uh, you measure gravity and you measure other things, vibration, you tend to say that uh, you tend to conclude Mercury must have a very small core. Just from the vibration measurement, the inner core can be big. Because it's big, you're going to gravitationally couple with the upper there, and going to significantly reduce the vibration amplitude. But if you're a geochemist, you tend to think that the inner core must be big because Mercury is small and it has its cold. It evolves such a long time. I cannot imagine maintaining a liquid, from a chemical point of view, I cannot imagine maintaining a larger portion of liquid core inside Mercury. So it's still constantly under debate how big the inner core inside Mercury. But we know for sure there is a liquid iron part. Um, the interesting about Mercury, because it's small, the pressure range inside the core uh, is an order of magnitude smaller than the pressure range inside Earth's core. And that gives you interesting thermodynamic properties. Um, for Earth, we know pretty much sure that the buoyancy forcing is the so-called bottom forcing. That is, the iron first nucleate near the bottom of the core. Then this, the light element sulfur gets released from the bottom. But for Mercury, we're actually not sure where the iron first nucleates near the bottom or near the top of the core. In the, therm in the uh, pressure and temperature range in Mercury's core, iron can either nucleate from the uh, top or from the bottom. It's very sensitive to the exact composition. You change the composition by a tiny bit, then it starts to nucleate from the top rather than from the bottom. If iron nucleate from the top, gonna, these uh, iron dipoles will try to uh, sink rather than so you're actually driving the system from above rather than from below. So we don't have this ambiguity for Earth. I mean, we know for sure Earth is this one. But for Mercury, we actually don't know which one, which exactly is the case. By nucleation, do you mean liquid to solid? Yes. Phase change. Yes. Phase change, yes. Um, I, won't, I won't go into the details in this one, but I'm just trying to show you that there's a peculiar property in the melting curve of iron. So you, there's a little kink here. So you can add either, either, if you touch the curve on the bottom, you actually nucleate iron here. And if you touch the curve on the top, you actually nucleate iron here. So that's where the ambiguity actually comes from for mercury. And this is 40 gigapascal. The Earth's core is actually here. It's 300 gigapascal. So mercury and Earth are not even in the same pressure regime. And so I'm going to try to tell you uh, our uh, explanation for this uh, north-south asymmetry. And first of all, we don't have uh, any uh, north-south asymmetry in the controlling factors. All the setup in our calculations is symmetric across the two hemispheres. And we find that top forcing, the, the one I talked about earlier, is actually a prerequisite for this uh, north-south symmetry breaking. And also, the slow rotation of mercury actually helps uh, promote the uh, symmetry breaking um, we're, we're seeing. Um, I'm not going to talk about mantle here today, but um, let me just mention. So we're actually doing, a, for, for this study, we're doing a Poussin-esque uh, calculation in a non-dimensional form with uh, magic. And those are the uh, dimensional, uh, non uh, dimensionless parameters, if you care. So the ACM actually goes from uh, 310 to minus 4 to 310 to minus 5. The Rayleigh number has been varied from 1 uh, to 100 times supercritical. The Prandtl number is kept at 1, the magnetic Prandtl number being varied between 0.5 and 2. And this is really a realistic consideration. Any number uh, below 0.5 actually can maintain a dynamo. Um, so I'm, I'm showing you a uh, data model comparison here. So on the left, I'm showing you the uh, Mercury measurement, uh, messenger measurement of Mercury. On the right, I'm showing you the, uh, a cal uh, my dynamo calculation. And for Mercury, we actually know, only know the first three uh, uh, magnetic moments, so dipole, uh, quadrupole, and octopole. And in our calculation, since we know all the way to our resolution uh, limit, and we actually see an interesting feature. So the solution is dipole, quadrupole dominant, but uh, uh, all the higher moments actually are, uh, is, uh, had a comparable power at the dynamo surface. Um, so dipole quadruple together is dominant over all, everything else, and everything else actually is have relatively similar power. Um, and this is actually a um, stable solution. It does not oscillate between the north and south. I'm showing here the uh, magnetic equator offset, which is just a, a proxy of how different the two hemispheres is. 
if it's offset to the north, it means the northern hemisphere is, has stronger field. If it's offset to the south, it means the southern hemisphere has stronger field. So we start from zero. So the input, so the initial field is a weak, uh, uh, weak dipole, purely symmetric with respect to the equator. And after a, a short uh, initial uh, unstable, it quickly settled to a stable offset. So for the uh, uh, four magnetic diffusion times you're running, it's uh, all stable. And it's also actual domain, so the uh, non-axis symmetric power uh, is uh, less than 10%, uh, except in the initial uh, unstable per moment. Um, and this actually really is a classical example of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, because before we run the case, you cannot predict whether you're going to get a stronger field in the northern hemisphere or stronger field in the southern hemisphere. But once it settles to one hemisphere, it just stays there. So there's also equal number of runs where actually it's stronger in the southern hemisphere. So there's no particular, uh, there, uh, having stronger field in the northern hemisphere is not more special than having it in the southern hemisphere. But one hemisphere is stronger than the other. That's actually the key part. Now, which hemisphere is stronger doesn't actually matter. I ask uh, it's trying to envisage in my head what the combination of multipoles look like. So, so if you have a dipole that, um, so the, the, a, a, a factor of three difference between north and south pole must be the linear combination of just the dipole and yes. the pole. Yes, yes, exactly. And so the quadrupole is rotated at 45 degrees or something to the axis of the dipole or something like this. Oh no, the all the actual uh, actual dipole and actual quadrupole are all. Uh, symmetric with rec to the spin axis. So dipole is you have uh, positive on one hemisphere, negative on the other hemisphere. Quadrupole is you have same polarity on the poles, then you have a different polarity at the equator. Okay. So yes. So this is just. Uh, yeah, it, you can think it as a leap. Pole is neither here nor there, really. I mean, it's sort of not going to generate much of an asymmetry, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So. Uh, Okay, that's fine. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. Sure. Okay. But just out of curiosity, what is it in your simulation that decides which pole gets the greater strength? Is it just a numerical noise? That, um, no, I, I don't think it's. Uh, I think it's really just what the initial, the the initial unstable moment is doing. So it's really this moment actually determines which one you set into. There's like 50% of a chance you set into one hemisphere. There's 50% of chance you set settle into. Run the program again. Would you get a different result, or what? Or well, if you give it a slightly different perturbation, oh. so it's really the the initial perturbation. So it just depends on the details of how you set up the initial field. Yeah, I think uh, as, as yeah, I mean for spontaneous symmetry breaking, it's really just extremely sensitive to the initial condition. I mean that's just a definition of. Those things like if you slightly different, you know, even if you infinitesimally different in the initial condition, you can end up at two different branches. I mean, that's just a classical definition of. Well, I remember what I was going to ask. What's, the, what's the maximum ratio you could achieve by combining a dipole with a quadrupole? Oh. Uh, is, this a, is this a maximum solution? Or something? No, no, no. This is definitely not the uh, maximum solution. Um, I'm just showing. I, I had a series of solutions. Uh, where you go from purely symmetric to more and more asymmetric. Um, I think the most asymmetric solution here I achieved is twice more asymmetric uh, than, than what we observed at Mercury. Yes? By the way, are you showing everything at the surface of the uh, liquid core? Or yes. At the surface of the planet? Yes, uh, but the, okay. because Mercury's core is so close to the surface, yeah. it's 0.85%, so the difference is tiny when you look at the surface and look at the core. You won't see any difference. Actually, your eyes won't pick any difference. Mm. Yes. So does this symmetry breaking have to do, you say it says from top forcing, does it have to do with an axisymmetric convective mode? Is there a converging flow on the stronger pole? Yes, there yeah. is a converging flow on a, uh, on a stronger pole. That's exactly what is happening, actually. No. Really, really a question. You yeah. said the top forcing, but didn't you also say this was a, uh, it wasn't very rotationally constrained? Uh, it's like the slower you rotate, it's easier to excite this mode. Yeah. So have, so have you actually disentangled those two effects, top down, top, the top? Oh, forcing yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, the uh, bottom up forcing has been extensively explored in the, uh, for studying the Earth's uh, 
for the geodynamo community, like um, for decades, but they never see an asymmetric magnetic field. No, I understand, but the geodynamo is, is rapidly rotating. That's true. But the parameter regime, they actually explored a quite a large parameter regime. Okay. So that's uh, Uli Christensen did that. Mm -hmm. okay. So can I move on? Um, so those are actually what the 3D magnetic field lo lines look like in the solution. So they are actually strongly uh, twisted in one hemisphere. You can see it? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you see? It? Yeah, I'm sorry for the the background <laughs> color being so close to the spherical. So the equator is here. I mean, the field lines are strong, uh, strongly concentrated actually in one hemisphere. So it's not just that you see a stronger field on the surface. It's actually inside the entire dynamo region. Uh, are you going to show any differential rotation? A, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I, I don't have a differential rotation here. Um, but the differential rotation is actually a, uh, is asymmetric across the equator. You have prograde jet in one hemisphere and a retrograde jet in another hemisphere. Oh, so you have strong <laughs> shear near the equator. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you actually had an asymmetric uh, differ differential rotation as well. Yes. I really should add that plot. What's the energy ratio between differential rotation and magnetic uh, energy? Uh, relative energy between differential rotation and convective flow? Oh, no, uh, differential rotation and the magnetic energy. Oh, you, you are asking about the, oh, uh, uh, kinetic energy. Uh, in the solution, kinetic energy dominates, actually, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, inside, inside planets, we actually know magnetic field dominates. Yeah. Um, in those calculations, um, uh, for this context, actually, whenever you have a magnetic energy stronger than the kinetic energy, uh, you always don't have a dipolar magnetic field. So the dipole breakdown happens before the uh, magnetic energy becomes equivalent to the kinetic energy. That's usually what we see in those calculations. So maybe you showed this and I missed it, but what, yes. what's, what's the actual um, thermal forcing? Is it a bounding condition or is it a volume forcing? Uh, it's, uh, it's volume forcing for this one. Volume but forcing. then you have a... Uh, uh, so for the uh, bottom forcing, you have positive flux at the bottom boundary. You have zero flux on top, because you're uh, entirely thinking of compositional convection. Nothing leaves your volume. And for the top forcing case, you have flux at the top. Then you have uh, volumetric source terms in the entire volume to balance the. So that's, you, that's you, a different you have setup. A flux that's independent of the it lets like an external flux that's one at the top. Yes. And so it's that flux convergence that's being yes. described. Okay. So, yeah, that's the setup for the two different forces. Um, so when we look uh, closer to what actually happened in the flows, so not just I told you the properties of magnetic field, I haven't tell you the properties of flows, except I tell you the, what the differential rotation looks like. So if you look at the convective flows, not the differential rotation, what you actually find is that uh, we actually excited uh, two different fundamental modes of columnar convection. and Together, they actually created a north-south asymmetric uh, kinetic helicity, and which, which just naturally gave you to the ma The magnetic view different, you see in the 3D plot, is, is uh, essentially similar to if you plot kinetic helicity, you will get the same thing. Kinetic helicity is stronger in one hemisphere and then the other. So what are the uh, two fundamental modes of columnar convection? So um, the so-called even mode and odd mode, I'm trying to illustrate it here. Color shows you the uh, vorticity, so blue negative, red positive, and the black arrow is actually showing you the actual flows. Um, and in most of the geodynamo calculations, um, what you actually see is the even mode. So the banana cells, actually, if you analyze its uh, symmetry property, is actually of the even mode. So you have this, you have same vorticity across the hemisphere, but the flow are actually divergent from the equator or convergent towards the equator. And that's actually what the even mode is. Um, this is the uh, most unstable mode. So you always get even mode when you start from um, onset. Um, there's also a mode called the odd mode, which was actually pre uh, predicted even before we predicted the even mode, 
but it turns out to be the second most unstable mode. So it's not easy actually to excite it. Um, so it's predicted by uh, Paul Roberts, 1968. Um, it actually has right the opposite uh, property across the equator in term uh, the symmetry property in terms of the uh, vorticity and also in terms of the actual flows. I'm sorry. Um, if you only have one of uh, uh, one of the two modes in your system, the elicity is actually uh, symmetric across the equator. Th those those these are always negative elicity. These are positive elicity, and this is also a positive elicity, and negative elicity. That's always the case. Um, but if you actually have if you have two modes actually present in your system, and if you two also have similar wave numbers, and what you can have that they actually can uh, enhance each other in one hemisphere and um, uh, suppress each other in another hemisphere. And that actually what gives you the different kinetic helicity across the two hemisphere. And you can uh, think that whether you goes to whether one hemisphere gets a stronger kinetic helicity actually determines the nonlinear interactions between the two modes. They either can be locked into northern hemisphere or can be locked to the southern hemisphere. Um, so these kind of two modes actually are also uh, predicted uh, in asymptotic uh, models. So those are asymptotic uh, models. Those are essentially are 2D calculations where you assume, so those are latitude versus Rayleigh number. So latitude is in the sphere, in the spherical uh, shell, you imagine where the convective column actually touches. When it touches the surface, where actually the latitude is, whether it touches at 45 degrees, means that the columns are roughly near the center of the shell. And if it touches at 90 degrees, means it's right at the spin axis of the uh, shell. And when you do that analysis, what you find that it's always easier to excite uh, convection uh, if you strictly follow this analysis, you will get, oh, maybe the um, uh, most easiest way to get convection going is at zero latitude, so right at the equator. Actually, that's not the case. When you do convection, what well, most likely you'll get is 45 degrees, because there is actually an interplay between where you set a convection and how effectively the convection actually can transport heat. Because at zero degrees, there's essentially no volume for you to do anything. If you set up convection at 45 degrees, there's lots of volume to do it. And also, it has a favorable low Rayleigh number. So if you plot a realistic curve, it probably goes like that. So it had a minimum near 45 degrees. That's where you always see your convection. Um, you always get an even mode first. And that's what this analysis confirms. But when you force them stronger enough, you can actually get odd mode and onwards and all these modes. So, if you, uh, uh, so what you would predict from this analysis is you have symmetric kin kinetic helicity. Then in this range, you have uh, non asymmetric inequity, and if you go onwards, the asymmetry would actually decrease, and that's actually exactly what we find in our calculations. So this is a uh, asymmetry now in kinetic helicity and in terms of Rayleigh number. Uh, near onset, they are entirely symmetric across the equator, and then when you excite the odd mode, you, you excite the asymmetric kinetic helicity. When you keep going stronger, they actually are decreasing. So that's exactly what we're seeing. And the reason I'm saying slower rotation actually helps is if you put your if you put where you find those solutions in a heat flux rotation rate diagram, this is actually where you get. So the faster you rotate or the slower you force it, you tend to get a dipolar solution. Or the slower you rotate or the stronger you force in your system, you tend to get a multipolar solution. And between the two actually you tend to get a hemispherical um, solution. And so this is a um, quick summary of the uh, Mercury study. We have uh, messenger reviewed a significant uh, north-south asymmetry in Mercury's field. And we propose a dynamo explanation for this symmetry breaking as a result of the mutual excitation of two fundamental modes. And the question in planetary science is always, why Mercury? Why not Earth? Why not other planets? And we think uh, as, uh, it comes down to uh, subtle things like iron, uh, the composition and pressure in Mercury's range that gives you the top buoyancy forcing. And also, the relative slow rotation of uh, Mercury uh, helps to kick you into the uh, asymmetric branch. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not talking about mantle here, but that actually also is something I can talk. Um, so now I'm going to the third part of the talk. And I'm going to talk to you about transition region inside a giant planet. And here is an art artist. Uh, uh, 
figure of what Saturn looks like. Um, and you know it's not a scientific figure because uh, when you set a cloud layer, you set 125 miles instead of kilometers. Um, now, <laughs> in contrast to what this what this picture tries to show you is actually trying to show you there are sharp boundaries inside planets, right? It tries to show you inside Saturn there's a metallic hydrogen region which is shown in red, and there's a molecular hydrogen region which is shown in pale. But actually, there's no sharp boundary here. It's actually a smooth transition going from uh, molecular hydrogen to metallic hydrogen. Um, just as I did for Mercury, I'm going to give you the basics of uh, giant planet in our solar system. They are hydrogen helium dominant. If you look closer to its atmosphere composition, when you compare it to the sun, the helium and neon actually depleted, and everything else seems to be enhanced. And in terms of energy, uh, both Jupiter and Saturn actually emits, uh, emit about twice as much energy as they receive from the sun. So they actually are heat engines themselves. Um, and all the heat actually just coming from the prim uh, primordial uh, gravitational energy you know, when you put them together. Um, the, if you, you can, when you measure the intrinsic heat flux, then you compare it to how much heat can be conducted along an adiabat. You find that the intrinsic heat flux is about 100 times what you can conduct it along an adiabat. So you know it's actually supercritical. There must be active convection going on to bring that much heat out. And the rotation period of both giant planets is around uh, 10 hours. And here I'm actually showing you uh, the magnetic field and zonal flows of uh, the uh, uh, two uh, for Saturn, actually, in particular. I will, I will focus more on Saturn in this one. And so in the bottom, actually, I'm trying to show you the zonal flows. And only in the leftmost uh, panel actually shows you the observation, you know, what are the observed surface zonal flows are. And you see two curves. One is red, one is blue. And it's the same measurement, but when you put into a different uh, rotational frame, because we actually don't know Saturn's rotation rate uh, within five minutes. So the red one is assume a rotation rate of about 10 hours and 39 minutes, and the blue one assume a rotation rate of 10 hours and 34 minutes. So five minutes apart, and actually gives you quite a different uh, zonal flow structure. And the both, uh, it doesn't matter what frame you look at, it's definitely super rotation near the equator. And if you look at the slightly shorter frame, you actually have alternating jets at high latitude, so going eastward and westward, alternating uh, several times. Um, but if you actually believe a slightly longer rotation period, uh, most of the jet at high latitude are all prograde. Um, I think most, uh, uh, the favored uh, rotation period is actually the shorter one, which actually gives you a, uh, a zonal flow that looks more like that of Jupiter. And it's a central question here for giant planets. We observe those zonal flows on the surface of the giant planet, but we actually don't know how deep those flows are. For the sun, from helioseismology, we know the zonal flows are actually uh, in the entire convective zone and sharply truncated at the tachocline. But for giant planet, we actually don't know. And so two competing pictures. One is those actually went all the way down to certain uh, radius. Uh, most likely where the uh, magnet, where the uh, uh, Lorentz force starts to matter. And, or you actually, the zonal flows mostly are shallow features. Those are just atmospheric jets. Those are just uh, like the zonal flows you have on Earth and all this terrestrial planet. So those are the two competing uh, uh, pictures. We have a one point measurement for Jupiter. So we have the Galileo probe being dropped uh, inside Jupiter. And along the path, so this is the pressure increase. So this is where the Galileo, so this one, is, this is deeper in the planet. This is uh, shallower in the planet. So in that, what we observe on the surface is a wind about 100 meters per second. When the Galileo probe has been dropped, you actually observe a decrease, uh, an increase in the wind speed. So wind increased by almost a factor of two to about 180, and then stays constant to about uh, 21 bar. 21 bar is where the Galileo probe stops uh, communicating back to us. Um, so that's the uh, only in situ measurement we have. But 21 bar is still, 21 bar is both deep and shallow. So in terms of the picture of the entire planet, 21 bar is extremely shallow. It's less than 0.5% of the planet radius. 
But if you think in terms of atmosphere dynamics, 21 by is very deep because the, sol the uh, solar insulation actually only goes down to about uh, uh, a 0.1 bar, actually. So 21 bar is actually very, 21 bar is deep from an atmospheric perspective, and 21 bar is shallow from a planetary interior uh, perspective. So even if we have this point measurement, the, the debate is still going on. Where is the top of the convection zone thought to be, roughly? I think it's point, point, uh, a, a point 0.1 bar, I think. Point 0.1 for the top of the convection zone. Yeah, so that's, the, actually the, that's the radiative, is, radiative convective boundary. The Galileo pro, so is the Galileo probe here in the stably stratified region or in the unstably stratified? Uh, unstably stratified, I think. Uh, it goes from the stably stratified region to yeah, the unstably stratified. Yeah, it actually went through some of the convection yes. zone. Yes. Fascinating. Um, so yeah, um, so there's uh, definitely a, a debate on this one. Where the, so the two pictures being proposed is either you have uh, the wind goes all the way through, or you actually have shallower, the wind's shallow and stronger on the top and uh, shallower on the bottom. Actually, um, is the time strict? Should I stop uh, at five minutes before? For another five to ten minutes. Okay. Yeah, I tried. It, we can stop at any moment. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's always hard to give two talks in the same one. But I want to. <laughs> I want. But this is a chance to talk to a solar physicist about planetary science. So I want to give as much information as I can get. Um, so the interesting thing about giant planet, of course, is actually the as I said earlier, is the connectivity actually goes a smooth transition. You don't go from conducting to uh, insulating sharply. You actually smoothly. So in, this is showing the electric conductivity inside Saturn from about 0.6 Saturn radii to 1 Saturn radii. So it goes from about 2 times 10 to the 5s and all the way to insulator. And here I'm cutting a, a region from 0.6 to 0.85 where the conductivity has dropped to about 5 Siemens per meter. That's about the conductivity of the, uh, the, uh, the seawater. And the, this region might matter because if you think about what the magnetic Reynolds number can be, even if you, you assume the uh, flow at this point is as strong as the surface flows, the magnetic Reynolds number here is about 1. So probably this region is the very region you care about when you study MHD. Um, and we have uh, upcoming observational constraints, actually. And the Juno spacecraft will arrive at Jupiter in 2016, and the Cassini Proxima orbit, and the official name is Grand Finale, and we're actually starting in 2017. And uh, both those uh, orbits will be extremely close to the host planet, and in particular for Cassini, Cassini will essentially be in the at upper atmosphere of Saturn. So Cassini will be between the rings and Saturn. So all the previous measurements, Cassini is outside of the rings, and now you're going to dive between the inner edge of Saturn's ring and the surface of Saturn. And it will actually be in the atmosphere of Saturn. And in the last one, it's also going to plunk uh, into Saturn. And we'll also try to transmit as much data as back. Wow. So it's going to act as a Galileo probe to us. Wow. Um, <laughs> we're going to make high precision gravity field and magnetic field measurements. And we're going to use them to constrain the zonal flow structure inside the planet. I want to first talk about gravity field a little bit. Probably I want to probably have to stop right at talk about gravity. Um, the central idea is this: if the winds are shallow, and the gravity, this is the gravity moments, and this is a, a amplitude, and the gravity moments will follow this green curve. So it's a uh, just an uh, it's just a power law drop. And so you have J two J four, and then uh, if it's uh, most, it's a solid body rotation, and a high order gravity moment will be quite small. And if the zone of flow actually goes deep, and the gravity moments will actually level off. And those are different, uh, different calculations. But as long as the wind goes uh, uh, to a certain depth, say 10% uh, of the planet radius, it will actually produce gravity signals, where you can see. Um, so the gravity measurement central idea is the gravity moments is actually a, uh, is an integral of the density structure. And if you have uh, zonal flows, you can actually estimate what the density perturbation is uh, using a thermal wind uh, balance. And then you plug that back in, you actually can evaluate what the 
um, gra gravity moments are. You plug in different wind profiles, you get different gravity moments, and that's that's the central idea. Um, and meanwhile, we also want to use uh, magnetic field uh, to constrain the zonal flow as well. I'm going to fast forward and just give you a quick overview of what actually I've been doing. So the central idea is this. Although we observed a smooth um, dipole magnetic field on the surface of Saturn, but like that of the Earth, the magnetic field inside Saturn could be more complex. And what we're essentially looking for is, is there any in the small scale structure of the magnetic field, can we actually see any correlations between the magnetic field and the high latitude zonal flows? So here's a calculation I did where I showed on the top is actually the uh, magnet, the radio component of magnetic field. On the bottom actually showing you the zonal flows. So you have prograde, uh, retrograde, and prograde. And uh, as long as the uh, magnetic Reynolds number goes to high enough, actually, there will be um, correlations between the magnetic field and the zonal flows. And that's also another key diagnostic you can use to answer the question of how deep those winds actually go. Um, I think it's a good place to stop, but I'm going to give you a quick overview of the upcoming opportunities of if you study planets, dynamos, mm. uh, dynamics. So MESSENGER, the one that discovered the north-south asymmetry of Mercury's magnetic field, will actually impact Mercury <laughs> next week, I think. Um, but before that, it is already makes a lot of detailed measurement near the surface of Mercury. So we will have an update about Mercury's magnetic field. And so we probably will see, right now, you see uh, what has been reported is dipole, quadruple, and octuple. Probably we're going to have a better idea of what the high moments are. As I mentioned, 2016, Juno would um, get uh, Jupiter and make the close measurement. And this is the Cassini. And that's the trajectory of the end of Cassini mission. So we're going to dive between the ring and the planet. And Papi Colombo going to be at uh, Mercury in 2024. So that's a two spacecraft, one, e one, one in a circular orbit around the planet, one in a elliptic orbit far away. And they're going to help you separate the external field and internal field better constrain the internal field. And JUICE, um, the ESA JUICE mission 2033 can uh, m measure the magnetic field and the gravity field of uh, Ganymede, so the only moon that actually has large-scale magnetic field. So I think there's uh, quite good opportunity for studying uh, magnetic fields and internal dynamics. And thank you. You mentioned that there are two different uh, scenarios for the formation of the cores of the giant planets, yes. whether it's well mixed or whether it's whether it solidifies out first. Does that make a big difference on the gravitational component of the um, thermal forcing, the buoyancy forcing? E oh, so there's actually a two separate question. From an observational perspective, if you actually want to constrain how big uh, the coils from gravity field, you actually first need to know how, how much zonal flow you have, because zonal flow are actually closer to you, so they actually produce more gravity <laughs> signals than the core do. <laughs> so only when you actually had a good enough understanding of the zonal flows, then you can say, oh, maybe there's a core down there, because in, usually it's, you, you, just, you just ignore zonal flows and interpret the gravity field. That's what has been typically done to say something about how big the core is. Now we realize we really need to get the zonal flow down first. Then we're going to say something about the core. In terms of thermal forcing, actually, I don't, quite, I don't think so. Because the rocky core in a giant planet is unlike the inner core of Earth. It's not a buoyancy source. Uh, it's actually stable. Well, I, I was saying you talked about helium rain. And, and yes. you're, you're saying the heat flux coming out of the planet uh, is greater than the solar uh, input yes. to, to that planet. Yes. So there's some amount of gravitational contraction. So part of that gravitational contraction is, is uh, has denser material going toward the core, yes. whether, whether that's distributed or... But still, the, yeah, even if you put all the helium down to the core, helium, the density of helium is still like 10 times lighter than what a rocky and uh, rock would be there under that pressure. So it doesn't make much difference yeah. on the structure of the convection cell. Yes. But if but if there's a, if it actually generates a compositional gradient, then we're in big trouble because then it could be in a double diffusive convection region, right. which we know so little about. <laughs>
Do you think there's, um, I mean, we're, we're stuck with remote sensing, and I'm wondering, in the sun. Yes. So I'm wondering if, if measurements of the ma magnetic field of these planets, um, in, in the magnetosphere of these planets, you know, Saturn, Jupiter, I mean, Eo, Taurus, you know, all this stuff, you, you're mostly interested in the moderately high order moments, so, uh, you know, or at least the combination of dipole plus the quadrupole. Yes. But I, I think, I mean, particularly if, if you crash a spacecraft into, into Mercury, you might send a whole plume of material up, which could be observed remotely, and you could get some more information on the radiation emitted by the ionized atoms and stuff like this. I'm just wondering to what extent you think that the techniques we use in solar physics might be used to help you understand mm -hmm. magnetic fields of planets via remote sensing from the Earth with big telescopes. Ah, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, we still need something to crash on the planet. <laughs> um, I mean, there are sources of iron. I mean, the, the Eo Taurus is regularly observed. Yes. So, so the uh, sodium lines. That's true. Uh, are, um, are regularly observed in various planetary environments. Yes, and uh, also there's uh, always ongoing effort to actually measure the aurora of the giant planets because that's what you can see, right. and by just time averaging what the aurora shape is. Uh, you can actually, using that to constrain what the magnetic fields are, which has been done already, actually. But I mean, these are difficult observations to yes. both make and to interpret. So if, if, if with the line of sight integrations, we're not going yes. to get high order multipoles. So That's are true. these interesting or not? Because if they are slightly interesting, it would be worth pursuing. I mean, AGST would be, a, DPS would be a great instrument to do this kind of work, for instance, four meter solar yeah. telescope. I think it's uh, I think it's very interesting. The reason is actually very simple because planetary missions are always very very expensive, and you can only expect a few in your lifetime. And if you can actually get any information from other <coughs> techniques, it would be all uh, would all be very extremely useful, actually, valuable. Just from a, like a cost and efficiency perspective, they're going to be very uh, uh, valuable. But I mean, it's interesting that you haven't. I mean, there are measurements of planetary magnetic fields using remote sensing like that in yes. astronomy, and you didn't mention it. Already. So I'm just yeah. wondering to what extent those are useful or not. I mean, we may be able to do considerably better, but it would take a lot of effort. I think. Yes, yes, I, I believe so. It can take uh, serious effort uh, for in that direction. Okay. Yes. So regarding the uh, asymmetry marking, so yes. Do you do uh, hydrodynamic theorem and uh, without magnetic field? Yes, yes, we, we did that. Can you uh, obtain your asymmetry? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's it's really a it's really a hydrodynamic uh, asymmetry. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how robust that is? If you could, like, it, where are you numerically compared to the actual planet parameters? Where, um, where's where's the weak spot where more numerics could actually? change or not change the answer? Is it Ekman number? Is it, what's the? Yeah, um, we always talk about Ekman number. But I think the root uh, to actual planet will be similar to the root Uli Christensen take is uh, by deriving uh, scaling mm -hmm. relationships. So in the uh, plot, I show where the uh, heat flux and uh, rotation period, where I show where these solutions actually reside in, and actually keep pushing the boundaries. See whether those are actually parallel lines, mm -hmm. or they're actually getting wider or they actually uh, converge. So if they're parallel, that's good. It like, doesn't matter which regime. We're going to always see those three types. If they're getting wider, that means you actually have more chance to see uh, asymmetric. If they converge, that actually means we won't see them at high, uh, more realistic parameters. But that's, you would only know when you actually do those exercises. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks again. Okay. Thank you.